part of the part of my life story. It would be a lot faster putting it on cassette than writing it down for you. After the big flood of 1953 in Kansas City, Kansas, I worked for a bonded wrecking company there. The flood had ruined a lot of buildings and we were tearing them down. We used a crane. We'd wrap the cable around the rafters and joists of the various buildings and then uh, tear them loose so we could tear down the rest of the building more easily. One time we had the cable wrapped around several joists and instead of pulling a whole lot of the roof loose, about four or five of the joists broke loose and the, the cable was stretched about like a bowstring so that when those uh, joists and rafters pulled loose, the crane jerked them back quite fast and they came directly at me. And if they were about waist height or a little higher, if I hadn't ducked underneath them, they would have probably, I'm sure they would have torn me in two. So well, that's one time my boxing experience paid off. I did bob and weave and get underneath those uh, flying joists and saved my life. It was after times like those that I appreciated life. Usually I was kind of bored with life, but when I'd have a narrow escape like that, why then it'd satisfy me for a while and, and I could uh, relax a little. Then riding the freights from Tucson to Fresno, California. I had a good friend in Tucson, and he looked too dangerous to, for people to pick him up when he was hitchhiking, so he always rode the freights. I never had ridden them before, but we started off. I had my guitar in my hand, and he we threw all our clothes together in a in a duffel bag which he was carrying. He jumped on the train first and then I ran to <clears throat> grab a box car and I wasn't going quite fast enough. Got jerked off of my feet and dragged for about 20 feet before I let go. I was holding the guitar up in the air so it wouldn't get banged around on the railroad ties. The next time when I got up I realized I was going to have to run a lot faster so after that, every time I grabbed a freight car, well, I was going a little bit faster than the freight car was. We got locked in a grain car one time, and you can't unlock those from the inside. It happened, there was an old wino in there, and, and he was muttering to himself and everything. He had a bottle of wine, and Jim, my buddy, was willing to drink with him. I wasn't about to drink out of the same bottle as that old wino, so I was there cold sober for two or three hours listening to that old wino talk, crazy talk. Finally, we got in Fresno and pounded on the door, and a yard man came along and opened the door and let us out. That's how come we got in Fresno instead of Bakersfield. Fresno, of course, was where I married Jim, Jim Bob's mother, James Robert, my first son. I met her when I was singing with the cowboy band out there. That guitar really came in handy every time we'd pull in one of the train yards like Los Angeles or Yuma or any of the other uh, railroad switch yards. Why, the yard men, most of those were hillbillies or, or cowboy fans. I'd sing them a few songs, and they'd give us money enough so we could buy our meals, and then they'd find us a good warm place to sleep, maybe a mail car that had a stove in it or something. That was in February, and it was a little cool, even down there around Needles, California, and Yuma, the Imperial Valley. And 
when we were riding the freights, but brakeman came along, he'd always see that guitar, and he never was too anxious to kick us off of the freights, like happens sometimes. When I first went, got out of the Army, I went out to California. I was thinking of shipping out in the Merchant Marines or the Navy, get over to the South Pacific maybe and get in on some of the fighting. But the doctors that examined me for the Navy and the Merchant Marine, they figured I was too much of a rugged individualist to fit very well into to any organization like the Armed Services or the Merchant Marine. So I didn't get into those. I met a rancher that had an old cabin way up the head of a canyon there between Los Angeles and Bakersfield by the town of Lebec, California. And I, he let me stay up there in that cabin for all one winter. I was up there trapping furs and living off the land. The only rifle I could find was in an army surplus store. That was an old single shot 4570 rifle, the same as a lot of them they used in the Spanish-American War. Had a 500 grain bullet, which is about three times as heavy as most of the bullets that we use in the 30-06 nowadays, that big rifle of mine. That was a black, the cartridges were black powder. Every time you'd fire one, why, there would be 18 inches of flame shoot out the front, plus an awful lot of smoke, a big cloud of smoke, so that you had to step to one side and look around the smoke to see if you'd hit what you aimed at. I used to carry a patch on the cleaning rod, and it was back about two inches from the end of the barrel. And one time, there was always so much flame coming out of the end of that barrel. At one time, I set that patch on fire way back under the barrel. I used to shoot jackrabbits, cottontails, brush rabbits, and other things with that 4570, but I always had to aim for the head. I found out that if you just, if you got close enough to the head, you just shaved off the hair while it would still kill the rabbit that I was shoot, that you were shooting at. I got some venison about a week after I moved up there. It was uh, pretty nice weather. We'd had some rain and snows, and it never got very cold there. So that the cheat grass was up about three inches high and was really tender. And the deer feed on that a lot in the spring. Well, February and March out there is springtime. So I finally saw a forked horn, a uh, two-point buck out there. And I shot at him, but with that big old 500 grain bullet, it dropped so fast that, that uh, you had to be really careful about estimating your range. I fired and the first bullet went underneath him and then I held way high over him and shot and I killed him that time. Then when I was walking up to him there was a nice big four-point buck that came up out of the draw by him was tiptoeing around there. I kept walking up and stopping to aim the rifle at him and think how easy it'd be to kill him I walked up within about 50 yards of him before he finally took off. Had a nice experience one time. I was walking by a patch of the scrub oak that grows out there and heard a terrible commotion inside uh, that patch of scrub oak. I wasn't sure if it was a bear or a bunch of deer or what it was, but I got the rifle off my shoulder and got ready for whatever it happened to be and here a uh, Cooper's hawk flew out and dropped a nice big fat mountain quail at my feet and he had most all the feathers picked off. So I thought that was very nice, that Cooper's hawk, to make me a present of that good tasty mountain quail. Salt Creek ran right by the cabin 
and they were just loaded with watercress. So I had all the vegetables I needed there, the salad and the vegetables. I lived off of watercress pretty much that winter for my vegetables. Had a horse trough there that I bathed in. Of course, since it never got much below 40 degrees there, why it wasn't too bad a place for bathing. Used to get a lot of mushrooms on the sheep bedding grounds around there too, nice meadow mushrooms. When I first went to California, I went to Los Angeles. I worked for Swift and Company. I'd go out, I started work quite early in the morning. I'd be driving along there and there was so much smog that I couldn't see the street signs. I'd have to get out, stop the car, get out and look at the street signs to make sure where I was going to turn to get into the packing house where we lugged beef. That beef lugging is quite an art, too. And it takes a little strength to walk underneath a quarter of beef and swing it and let it land halfway on your shoulder and then uh, go load it in the trucks. I bought a 31 Chevy Coupe out there in Los Angeles. I didn't know much about driving. I'd just driven a jeep with an instructor by me a time or two and a big heavy army truck and didn't even know what a choke was for but I bought this 31 Chevy coupe and I drove it out on the streets of Los Angeles and I learned to drive there by driving in that Los Angeles traffic didn't have any serious accidents except when I was going up to Salt Creek Canyon it was a rainy night it was quite dark, and I suppose I was a little far over to the left on the highway. Anyway, a trailway bus I met up there on the highway, and it there was quite a loud thump, a big bang when the bus went by me, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't seem to do any great damage, so I kept driving, and then I finally found out I had a flat tire. That bus had been so close, it had uh, clipped that tire and uh, punctured it. So if it had been maybe a quarter of an inch or a half an inch closer to me, why, it would have, there would have been quite an accident there. It could possibly have killed me. It would at least have thrown me off the highway and, and caused an awful lot of damage to that car. When I lived in Bozeman, Walt Gordon and I both got uh, goat permits, mountain goat permits. We went into the crazy mountains up there north of Big Timber, Montana, and we backpacked in. The first night there we slept in a goat bed. We were that high up. Next morning we went up, started up the top of the mountain to locate the goats. That was the opening day of goat season. And we kept climbing and climbing, and finally the, the trail began to peter out. It was a knife blade ridge up there. Had maybe a foot or a little more of space where you could walk. But there was a steep fall on both sides. And I'd get dizzy every time I'd look down, way down, and see where I might wind up if I fell off of that trail. Anyway, there weren't very many fresh tracks up there, much fresh sign. So we came back down, and I started through the little trees, the croom holes that grows up there close to timberline. And I finally located some goat tracks, and I tracked down a couple of goats and shot one for Walt, and I shot one for myself. Pretty nice big billies. Then another time we were up there, and Walt was the only one that had a license uh, permit that time for goats. And he shot a young goat, probably about a two-year-old, and the goat spun around and ran behind the, the cliff there where he couldn't see it again and disappeared. And Walt had just slid down a small glacier there in the in the West Gallatin Valley 
and so he was pretty spooky about mountains. He couldn't make himself go down and track that goat down, so I had to. I didn't want to let some wounded animal suffer down there. So I took my 22 pistol, that one that I still have, and a rope, and I started down after it. And it was a perpendicular cliff where I started down, and it was pretty scary. I wasn't at all keen about going down and running over that mountainside or climbing over that mountainside trying to find that goat, but I had to. I was panicked there when I started out, but I knew that I had a hand and footholds so that I could go down that. And I made that vertical cliff all right. Then I went down and I found the goat's tracks, found where he'd spun around, so I followed him on around the cliff and I came to a slanting piece of rock in the trail and I had to go across it. There, was, there wasn't any other way around, everything else was straight up and down. So I knew that if I tried to walk slowly across that slanting rock that I'd get, I'd slip now and then and I'd have a good chance of dropping over the side. So the only way to make it was to run. I knew if I ran fast enough I'd have enough momentum even if my feet slipped two or three times I could still make it over. So I got up my courage and I ran across that and I made that all right. And I found the goat's tracks again and I tracked him to where there was a big washout in the trail. Another big gap and sheer mountainside on each side so I had to jump that. That was the only way over. So I got back and ran as fast as I could and I jumped that all right. And having conquered those three obstacles, why, then my fear left me. I felt so good about being able to do something that I thought I'd be scared to do that I had such a feeling of exhilaration I began to run and jump down that mountainside like a big horned sheep. And I finally had to get hold of myself and make myself slow down because I knew that I could sprain an ankle or break a leg there if I wasn't careful. So I kept going and I finally tracked the goat down and he was dead there. He hadn't lived very long, just long enough to go through all those obstacles. And when I found him there, there was about a 50 foot drop off there. So I had to drop the goat over that down by the shores of a little glacial lake. They call it Hindu Lake. Then I climbed down around the side of that sheer spot and uh, took the goat over to the lake. And I was so hot and sweaty there, the sun was shining pretty strongly. And being so hot, I peeled off my clothes and I dived in that, that lake to uh, wash myself off and to cool off and that lake was probably about 40 degrees it was so cold that I made one of the fastest u-turns that any swimmer has ever made and came back out and it cooled me off all right then I skinned the goat out and washed the hide off in the lake so the so that the pelt wouldn't be bloodstained the night before that We'd been using the binoculars and watching this two-year-old goat as he fed over on the mountainside. He was feeding down where the grass and the, and the herbs grow, the flowers and so on. And as we looked around over the mountainside, you could see things like, oh, a big black stump, like is left after forest fires in the mountains. And then I got to thinking, how come there's only one black stump there? If there was a forest fire there, how could there only be one black stump? What would let the fire spread? So I looked more closely at that, and here it turned out to be a big black bear, a real nice one. And he was stalking that mountain goat. He was creeping down that mountainside and getting closer and closer to the goat. And all of a sudden he made a rush but he, he rushed a white rock there. He, you know, bears can't see real good. So he had the scent of a goat in his nose, but he uh, rushed a big white rock instead of the, the mountain goat, 
and the goat saw him in plenty of time to run over and climb up on a big steep ledge where the bear couldn't uh, get to him and that was a nervous goat it's the only nervous mountain goat i've ever seen in my life usually they're pretty placid and phlegmatic but this one paced back and forth on that ridge for a long time to get over his scare and of course that bear would have been unlucky if he had managed to catch that goat we would have had time enough to go up the trail and get ourselves a nice black bear pelt then that's where far as i know that's the only cougar i've seen in my time in the wilderness you don't usually see mountain lions they usually stay out of sight but I was over on one side of one of the big wide canyons and I saw this mountain lion prowling along on the other side and he went into a grove of trees and he stayed in there quite a while and what I figure find must have happened judging by what happened later was that he managed to catch a blue grouse there and he stayed in that grove long enough to eat the blue grouse and the reason why I figured he caught one there was that he did stay in there for a while and then another one flew across all the way across that canyon and lit about oh 20 yards from me just the right range for that 22 pistol of mine so that cougar got one grouse for him and drove the other grouse over to me where i could get one one thing that was very interesting it was september well that's when the goats when they opened the season on goats was September there in the crazy mountains and I found morel mushrooms up there in September you get there in Bozeman and Bear Canyon by the Burnett's and the morel mushrooms fruit of usually about May well whenever the weather warms up slightly in the springtime so there was quite a difference there I had several tough times there in the crazy mountains I'd find what looked like a fairly decent spot to climb up one out of one canyon and get on top and go down another canyon and I've been in shale in shaley cliffs there where nothing was very solid all the shale you had to be real careful or it'd all tear off in your hands and and the loose shale would slip under your feet and several times I've climbed with a pack board on my back and a rifle on my shoulder and wishing that I didn't have either one of them because it was tough enough to climb those without any added added uh, hardships after I left Salt Creek Canyon I went to Jackson Hole Wyoming because the hunting was so good there and good fishing too I worked on ranches there in Jackson Hole for oh quite a while two or three years I guess one Sunday I wanted to go uh, bear hunting and the best place was on the mountain over across from the ranch so I saddled up this big bay colt he was about four years old and was wasn't too experienced in water and a whole lot of other things so we got down to the river and most of the river was pretty fast and rocky and everything it looked like it'd be hard to cross there so i found a nice smooth spot and i sure didn't know much about rivers then the old saying still water runs deep is really true because i took the bay colt down below the rough water the rapids and everything into that smooth water he took about two or three steps and he was in he, the hole the, the side of the hole dropped off so fast that that bay colt was in the water and the only thing that was sticking out was his ears and his nose and his eyes and he just stayed there he didn't even make a move he was so surprised i was sitting in water up to my armpits and I was waiting for that colt to make up his mind to swim or to turn around and come out or something and all he did was uh, just stand there he was so surprised I was just about ready to get out of the saddle and swim to shore 
When the colt finally made up his mind, he didn't like that, so he spun around and he came out of the water, and his ears were laid back. He didn't like any of that. And I was so wet, my boots full of water and everything, and pretty cold. That was in April, April or May, about the last of April, I guess. So I gave up the idea of bear hunting that time and went back to the closest ranch and and uh, well first I took off my clothes and wrung them out the best I could so I wasn't quite so wet and poured the water out of my boots and gave up the idea of bear hunting for that time anyway. When I was in the army down on maneuvers in Louisiana, one time I had a squad out on patrol and for some reason I got separated from them. It was, oh, just about dark and I knew about which way I had to go to get back to where I could locate my squad and my company. But I was evidently walking in circles because everywhere I turned I'd run into that black swamp water. Finally it got dark there and so I gave up the idea of trying to maneuver around there in the dark. I didn't want to walk through that black swamp water with maybe a few alligators around and, and most likely cottonmouths at least and a few coral snakes. So I stood up there. I was going to stand up all night because I didn't want, didn't like the idea of lying down there with the uh, snakes, at least the poisonous snakes. And I finally got so tired that I figured I might as well die of snake bite as die of exhaustion. So I lay down there. Didn't have any flashlight. Didn't have any matches. Didn't have any mosquito repellent. Didn't have anything really that I needed. But I went to sleep anyway. The only thing was that about every hour, hour and a half, why a, a group of mosquitoes had come by. Since there are about, I suppose, close to a hundred different species of mosquitoes around, why they all feed at different times. Some of them fed at dusk and some would feed just when it got dark for half an hour or hour or so and then quit. And, but all during the night while there'd be a new group of mosquitoes come along to get their share of my blood. But I'd, when the mosquitoes get too bad, they'd wake me up. I'd run my hand over my face and arms and kill a few hundred of them and, and uh, scatter the rest of them. And finally they'd give up bothering me and I'd go back to sleep again. Every now and then I'd be wakened by something galloping along through the grass and and uh, weeds, and I'm sure it must have been swamp rabbits. Might have been armadillos, but I doubt it. They would probably have been walking. But I woke up next morning. I must have lost, well, I don't know how much blood I lost, but it must have been considerable. But it didn't seem to bother me. I was used to it by that time. Then I went and found a, a man that had an airplane down there he was guarding. So I slept in his tent and ate on his groceries for a while and finally I went back and found my own outfit after a day or so. When I was a kid in Iowa, I had a good buddy named Albert Konitzny. We used to take our rifles and go out and hunt a lot and uh, we'd carry a little string and maybe a safety pin or two in our pockets and if we found a good hole in the creek, we'd stop and fish for a while with the bent pin and grasshoppers or worms, whatever was handy. We'd catch enough fish for a meal and we always carried a frying pan and a little grease and we'd build a fire and we'd have ourselves a fish fry. One time I shot a, a nice fat pigeon and we broiled it over a fire on a, on a spit which was supported by two forked sticks and we got that pigeon done just right, a golden brown. Didn't have any salt, but we didn't need any. Boy, that was a real good meal that we had there. Sometimes we, when we were prowling around, we'd find a garden way out far away from the 
farmhouse and one time we ran across a nice watermelon patch had these little icebox watermelons in it so we picked a couple of those good ripe watermelons and put them in the cool water by the creek in the shade where they stay cool till we got back there in the afternoon and we had quite a meal that time I learned the sound that a cottontail rabbit makes in dry leaves well I learned a lot of sounds and I learned what a squirrel looks like it's way up high in a tree all bunched up so it ordinarily looked like a knot on the limb but it doesn't take very long to learn the difference between a squirrel and a knot on a limb one time I was uh, Albert and I were walking by this on the edge of the forest and I heard something in the leaves and I knew what it was I'd heard that sound before so I told Albert that there was a rabbit there and I knew that the rabbit had just jumped out of his nest and ran through the leaves and was running through the trees about that time and Albert laughed at me and said oh you heard a field mouse there and about that time through a small opening in the trees by the rabbit ran by I had the shotgun then and I made a fast shot and I got the rabbit all right and after that why Albert kind of paid attention to what I told him whenever we we had a tough shot Albert had tried a time or two or three and and he wasn't as good on the rifle as I was so he'd finally had me shoot it for him I didn't miss very often <coughs> Bear Canyon by Bozeman was really well named. That was quite a place for bears. And I've seen quite a few around there. One time I was walking up the trail just out hiking through the timber on an afternoon. That's when I was going to college. And I came upon a fork in the trail and there was a bear about 50 feet from me. We both surprised each other never took very long for me to get a pistol out of the holster whenever anything was about to pop somehow that pistol was always in my hand and ready without my even thinking about it and this bear was as big as any I've ever seen he was a big active black bear in prime condition he spun around and ran up the trail a little way and jumped up a big Douglas fir tree and was looking around it at me around the trunk like a little cub will do and I just stood there he was a nice big bear and he would have made a real good bearskin rug and I kind of wanted him but I had some real important tests in college the next day and I knew I wouldn't have time to be uh, scraping the fat and the flesh off of a bearskin so I finally decided that I didn't want to shoot him but he was there watching me finally came down from the tree I hadn't moved much I just had that pistol lined up and ready in case he got any wild ideas I had that 401 Magnum and I wasn't at all worried about whether I could kill him with that baby that 401 Magnum will break up rocks pretty good it really has a punch the reason why I call it Cassius it talks awfully loud but boy it hits hard too anyway the bear finally came down out of the tree and walked a couple steps down the trail looking at me and then he walked a few more steps and then he walked a few more after a while and he got within 45 feet and that was my critical distance I knew as fast as he was it'd just take a few jumps and he could be right on me if he decided to and he was acting so different from most all bears that I wasn't at all sure what he was going to do but I had that pistol lined up between his eyes and and when he'd turn his head sideways while well, I'd line it up on the butt of his ear and debated whether I should shoot him or not and then decided I better not just didn't have time to fool with him so I told him I said you better get out you better take off and he was so big and powerful and used to being the boss of the woods that he didn't want to, to let on that he was at all worried about me he turned his head away trying to ignore me 
and uh, and looked at me and finally he stepped off the trail and went in some brush and I still kept the pistol ready because I wasn't sure what his intentions were and finally I saw the brush move again showing that he was moving off through the timber the rest of that afternoon I made sure that pistol slipped in and out of that holster very easy because he could have been behind a blowdown or could have been in a bunch of brush and he could have been waiting for me and he was just too big to play around with. I didn't want to fight him with my fist. One time we were out hunting morels, Dr. Hauser from the college and I, and we were up on this ridge up there above Burnett's and there's trails that run down through there and out of this one trail here came a bear just fast as it could run just heading right for us and I didn't have a pistol or anything and I yelled whoa and the bear stopped right in its tracks but just stayed there watching us I reached down and got a piece of uh, lodgepole pine and broke it off where it'd be the right size for a club and I was talking to the bear and telling it what would happen if it charged us and I guess it must have believed me because it finally turned around and took off. Then another time, I was walking through the woods there and all of a sudden something shot up a lodgepole pine like a monkey goes up a pole. Boy, it really went up there in a big hurry. And when it stopped up there, I could see it was a bear cub. And of course, immediately I started looking for the sow, for the mother bear and she happened to be on down in the bottom of one of the little draws and she didn't like the idea of me being that close to her cub that time i had the marlin 22 the one that uh, belongs to jody now and it has 19 long rifles in it so that i wasn't too worried about that bear i could have put four or five bullets where they would count even a 22 long rifle if you get him in the right place will kill a bear but that bear was running back and forth through the brush down there and bawling like a yearling Hereford making lots of noise but it didn't quite have nerve enough to come and charge me and one time in Yellowstone Park I was out looking around at some of the trees and here came a big cinnamon bear kind of a yellow one and he walked between me and the car and didn't seem at all scared of me. I reached down, picked up a rock. That was the only thing that I had to fight with in case the bear had come over and tried to pick a fight with me. And this, that bear was, he had to look back over his shoulder or out of the corner of his eye. And they claim that bears don't have very good eyesight. But that one saw me pick up that rock and boy, it took off because evidently it had been stoned by the rangers before it. The rangers would pick up rocks and throw at the bears to keep them from getting too tame so that they wouldn't uh, uh, harm somebody. Some of these uh, crazy tourists that try to push the bear in their car to take a picture and so on. That bear knew what it was to be stoned and one time in Jackson Hole, I was out deer hunting with that same Marlin 22. And I walked along and, and all of a sudden why a bear raised up down in the timber. And there was a big old sow and then I saw two little cubs with her. They were raised up too, looking at me. I had that Airedale pup with me that I had uh, bought in California. And I was a little bit worried about what he was going to do if he had gone over and started uh, barking at the bear and got her all spooked and irritated why she might have charged me. But uh, nothing happened. The dog just watched him. I watched him and finally I walked on away and left them alone. I had a pretty good bow when I was up there in Bear Canyon living in the Burnett's uh, old shack there. And I got pretty good with it. I could go out uh, bow fishing and come home with 200 pounds of carp about every time and <clears throat> put up a cotton leaf, a cottonwood leaf for a target, get back at quite a, well, different ranges. 
so I'd know how to hold that bow whether I was close up or far away. And so I went up. I knew where there'd been a big buck up by a fallen Douglas fir tree. I'd spooked him out once before. I went up to see if I could get a shot at him with that bow and got up there, well, part way. Looked up on the skyline. There were two nice big bull elk up there. Their heads and antlers were showing above the skyline, and they were just looking down on the valley. So, of course, I immediately began to sneak up on them along that fence row, and before I got up there, they turned around and ran off. And about that time, here came the biggest bull moose that I've ever seen in Bear Canyon. He was a really nice one. He was big as a horse and had a nice rack on him. <coughs> that time I wore a light colored uh, cowboy hat and it was about the color of moose antlers. That moose must have thought that I was another bull moose because he came down that hillside grunting like the bull moose do at the beginning of the rut when they're beginning to get in the mood to chase the cows and beginning to get a little quarrelsome. So he came down there, he was, he clipped those cherry bushes and the haw bushes as he came with those antlers. He was really in the mood to challenge me. With that bow, I figured it'd take quite a while to kill him. I was pretty sure I could kill him with a couple arrows, but I also figured that before he died, he'd kill me too. I figured I might as well avoid that. He was a little too big for that bow that I had. So I walked on out to where he could uh, get the breeze blowing from me so he would know for sure that I wasn't a bull moose, that I was a human. And then after that, why, I figured it'd be up to him. I couldn't outrun him. There weren't any trees very close by that I could climb. So the only chance I had was to either uh, get him to walk away without fighting or to just stand there and fight the best I could with that bow. But he did take off, and then coming right behind him, there was a nice young bull moose, probably about two or three years old, with smaller antlers. So I had plenty of moose there on my mind. After that, several times when I was up hunting deer with the rifle, walking through the paths, through the timber, I could hear that big bull as he walked by another path. And I could hear him grunting there. He was kind of challenging me, but didn't quite have nerve enough to charge. One time after a heavy snowstorm that lasted all night long, I got home from college in the afternoon and knew it would be a good time to go out and uh, hunt deer with that bow because there was lots of snow on the trees and it was warm enough to where that snow was dropping off making quite a bit of noise and the deer evidently hadn't fed that night because of the snowstorm so I figured they would be out early in the afternoon they'd be hungry and they'd be out feeding so I walked up there to the east of Burnett's place way over in the timber and I found some nice buck tracks so I followed them on down and I crept through the trees and got within 20 yards of three nice bucks and there were just too many pairs of eyes there. Finally one of those bucks saw my hand moving through the snow when I was trying to get in a better position to shoot and he froze there with his eyes bugged out about halfway out of his head and I knew then that uh, I probably wouldn't get a shot and sure enough before I could get the bow off all three of those nice bucks took off. But I still felt pretty good getting within 20 yards of three nice bucks, so I knew that I wasn't too bad a hunter. And one time I walked up to the top of Mount Ellis over to the west of Burnett's, and I shot a snowshoe rabbit sitting clear up on top of the mountain, sitting up on a survey stand left there by the U.S. Geological Survey. I shot that snowshoe rabbit and I was dressing it out and then a snowstorm hit. First snowstorm of the season and I wasn't ready for it. All I had on was Levi's and, and uh, 
cotton flannel shirt and it was kind of cold up there and besides that the snow was coming so thick that I couldn't uh, couldn't see what the difference between west and east or whatever and I'd start off for the mountain top down to come back down to Burnett's got turned around you know it's easy to circle in a snowstorm so I circled enough to where I came down the wrong side of the mountain I got way down